Welcome to Ray's Reflection, the Common Man's Bible Study. We have completed Acts chapter 2, and we're now about to begin chapter 3 of Acts. Today we will do the miracle, which covers verses, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. We will take a little bit from the f other portions of Scripture, such as verse 16, to support what we're going to say. At verse 12 begins Peter's second sermon. We'll probably keep that for next week. And uh, so, let me read this so we, so we can see the picture as a, as a whole, so we can see the whole thing. It says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his birth, was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alm. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he who sat for alms at the beautiful uh, gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as a lame man who was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch, that is called Solomon, greatly wondering. Now this obviously, as, as I read this, is a healing of a, of a lame man. Now, this is a miracle. Why was this done? There are two reasons, I believe, that this was done at this time. Now, when was this done? Not so much as <clears throat> when was it done. We don't really know. We're not sure whether it was on the day of Pentecost because of the actions in the statement in, in uh, uh, chapter 2 where it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread uh, from house to house. That could have taken a few days. So this might be more likely the next day or the day after, but it's very close in proximity to the Pentecost. More important than why this miracle occurred, or when this miracle occurred, is why it occurred. You have to understand that a new thing had entered into the world, and explanations were required. And who would explain this phenomena, this, this working of God? Teachers. Teachers who were sent from God would do the, the teaching. The problem was, the people, the common person, the common man, the, <clears throat> did not know who was sent from God. Because there were so many people who claimed to be teachers. You had rabbis, you had Pharisees, you had temple priests, you had all sorts of people claiming to be teachers of God, claiming to handle the, 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 the scriptures and giving it to the people, and they, quote unquote, were the ones who could explain any supernatural or any abnormal uh, activity. Now, we have to recall Nicodemus' conversation with Jesus Christ. When Nicodemus went to see Jesus Christ, he said, We know that thou art a man from God, because of the things that you do. Therefore, the actions would substantiate or validate the person. So in this case, the, the actions of healing, which only God could do, it's a creative type of healing, only God could do this, would validate the apostles. And if the apostles were validated, then their statement or their message was also validated. In other words, that's how you can tell which teacher was from God. It's interesting that we have this uh, healing. If you study the scriptures, any at all, 
throughout the New Testament, especially in the New Testament, you will find that the healings, whenever the healings are mentioned, there is always an apostle in the presence. Somewhere in the presence, there's an apostle. Now, the apostles themselves were doing healings. But other people also did healings, but those people who did healings, there was always an apostle present. And one of the reasons you don't have healings today is because there are no apostles. Now, we may like to say that a person uh, who ha has healing abilities, but if you ever listen very closely to them, their doctrine is always screwed up. It's always askew. It's not right on doctrine. It's, 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 it's off. There is no healings today. There are no miracles today. If a miracle occurs, it doesn't occur for the same reason that this did. Now, why did this miracle occur? I believe there are two reasons. The first is the one that everyone uses, and it's, and it's a common one, and it's an accurate one. These, God used these miracles to validate the apostles, which I just explained. The second reason and, you, and, we're going, and as we go through this, you will see this. The second reason is these people needed to be taught. Now you have two groups of people going into the temple. You have over 3,000 Jews who are believers. They got saved on the day of Pentecost. They're going to the temple too. After all, Peter and John are going to the temple. And they're going to the temple about the ninth hour, which is about three o'clock in the afternoon, which is about the time of prayer and the time of the sacrifices began. So they're going to participate in the Jewish activities. More likely, they're going there because they know most of the Jews are going there, and this will give them a great venue to, to preach and spread the word of Jesus Christ. The problem is this, the crowd that is going to this temple is made up of two people, two groups of people, saved Jews, over 3,000, and unsaved Jews, Jews who are still looking and still listening. Both of these groups cannot see the acts of salvation, because salvation is through the Spirit. In other words, when a person gets saved, there's no physical change about him. So therefore, they don't know what has happened to them. The believers are told what happened to them, but they really don't understand yet. And the unbelievers can't understand because they're still in darkness. The Holy Spirit has to open their minds. Now I want to take the believers, talk about the believers just for a moment. Let's take a, a, a young kid, a young child. Let's say the child is... Uh, a year and a half old or two years old, walking, etc. And uh, you're on the sidewalk with that child, and you don't want that child to go into the street. So you do the silly thing, and you give that child a 10-minute oration, a dissertation on the, the dangers of going into the street. That one and a half year old is going to look at you and just kind of draw a blank. It isn't going to work. You tell that child in simple language, no, don't go in the street. And when that child ignores you, and he will, he goes into the street, you apply some heat to his bottom. And he makes an association. That spank, he makes that association. He looks at the road, he feels the pain, he makes an association, and he will not go into that road to avoid the pain. He's learned. Your dissertation was a waste. This is no different. You have young Christians, just, just born-again believers, who don't know what is going on. They know they're saved, they've accepted Jesus as their Savior, but they really don't understand what has happened to them. They need, like that young child, they need a physical illustration of what has happened to them. And this is the miracle God chose to introduce the validation of the, of the, the apostles and to teach a lesson of what has happened to uh, these new born-again believers. And to give a physical illustration to the unsaved of what happens to a, belief, to, a, to a person when he believes. So we'll begin on that 
that basis, and I will, I will carry both of them through. Look at the miracle. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. When I told you, that's about 3 o'clock. And, and there was a certain man lame from his birth. This man was born lame. He was born a cripple. And he was carried because he couldn't walk. And obviously they weren't sophisticated with wheelchairs back then. They did have pallets, but they didn't have uh, any wheels. They had to be carried from place to place. And let's face it, it says this, it says, Whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Now this, this gate is, was huge, 60 feet. And, and uh, it was beautiful. It was laden with gold. It was just, it was just a beautiful gate. It's exactly what it is described here. And that's why it was given the name Beautiful. And people crowded or went to this gate to enter into the temple because it was so beautiful. It would be the, be the same thing as walking into a manor, uh, walking into the front door or going through the cellar door. Which would you, which would you prefer? Would well, you prefer the front door where all the, the ornate <coughs> things are? So these people were going in that. And there was another. They were going there to do two things. They were going there to pray and to offer sacrifices. In other words, they were going in there because of their sin. And therefore, they were in the proper mood, or, or <coughs> excuse me, they were desirous to be accepted by God. And obviously, if you put a beggar in their way, and they help the beggar, they assume that that act is going to have some favor with God that they're going to deal with in just a few, a few minutes. So therefore, it was a clever place to put the beggar. But catch this. He was outside the temple. So as we look at our illustration, this is a picture of an, un, an unbeliever. This is a picture of unsaved man. He is unable to walk, and he is unable to go into the presence of God. That's why he's pictured here. And the best he can do in life is beg. That's the best he can do. And, and I've seen it. You've seen it. I've seen it with my neighbors who, who will sit there with a beer in their, in their hands and be drinking, etc., and say something, etc., and look up to heaven and ask for forgiveness or, or hope they go to heaven one day. Or That's the beggar. That's the beggar in them. <coughs> and, there, and, and so he, he was strategically put in the right place. Now, when he saw Peter and John... Me. Oh, it's not working. My PowerPoint isn't working. Now, when he saw Peter and John going into the temple, he asked an alm. Now, an alm is, uh, is obviously a, uh, something you give to, to a beggar, and there he is sitting <coughs> on. So he hands out and he looks. I have been to the temple. Uh, I've been to Jerusalem and I've been to the temple and I have seen these people as you enter uh, Jerusalem and you pass through the walls I've seen these people, these beggars outside the wall and uh, we were told clearly uh, don't give to them and the reason we don't give to them is they're not beggars the state is supporting them they can't earn a living etc so the state has taken and they are, they are getting welfare from the state and they're acting as if they they, they, they <laughs> They're not on welfare, and they are. So they're just preying on, on ignorant tourists. <clears throat> but here, in this case, no one took care of him. He had to take care of himself, and this is how he made, made his living. Now Peter, and fastening his eyes on him with John, said, Look upon us. And he gave him heed, heed unto them. Think about it. He looked at them, and they said, look on us, and he looked. Now, as Peter and John are, are walking, so are a lot of other people. And if you're a beggar sitting there, and two people ask you, look at us, you're missing people going by. You could probably have income from people going by, etc. But yet this man was drawn to Peter and John. Peter said this, silver and gold have I none. In other words, I don't have this earthly, worldly goods. 
but what I do have I'll give to you. And this is what he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, when you look at that, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, it almost sounds like magic words, where you can say, in the name of Jesus Christ, do something, and the thing is done. And it, and it isn't. And we soon understand that it is. Most people look at this and they think that they can order uh, demons out of people and they can do all sorts of things in the name of Jesus Christ. But listen very carefully. There has to be something on the other end. Remember, when you look at God, God is not willing that any should perish. God is calling all, kind, all mankind. But there has to be a response on mankind's part. He can't just order it and Mankind responds. This isn't how God works, nor is He going to work that way here. So I'm going to take you from here to verse 16. And look what it says. And His name, through faith in His name, has made this man strong. So when you look back at Peter, and you say, and he says this, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. There has to be a reception on the other end. In other words, on Peter's end, he is extending the power or the authority of Jesus Christ to heal this man. But this man must receive it. He must, by faith, accept it. If there is no faith, is there is, if there is no response, if there is no belief on the beggar's part. That beggar stays there. The same way, can you imagine if we could go around saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, be saved? My goodness. We would go around, and every single person we would say, we would point at, and we'd say, in the name of Jesus Christ, be saved. And everybody would be saved. And it doesn't work that way. There has to be a response on the part of the beggar, or it has to be a response on the part of the, of the sinner. And therefore, that's what he says in verse 16, as part of his sermon, he's explaining to them, it is not the power that we have. It is the faith. It is the faith in the name of Jesus that made this man whole. And that's the key. The same way salvation comes to anyone. You are saved by faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ. If there is no faith, there can be all the begging in the world. And I have seen and talked to people, and I've asked, I've asked them, are you saved? And they go, boy, I hope so. And instantly that tells me there is no faith there. And, and consequently, there was no, there's no salvation. <clears throat> faith cometh by believing. And, and, if, and this man here believed that Peter and John, they, he believed in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, what did he do? Peter took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Immediately. It wasn't a process like a healing or a hospital would take would do it if, they, if they're trying to cure an individual. It was instant. And he, leaping up, stood and walked. The miracle was instantaneous. The miracle was complete. There was no, on his part, there was no well, taking a step forward and taking another step. And i got to get used to walking. I've never walked before. I don't like a, like a little toddler. That wasn't it at all. He was able to jump, he was able to walk, just like a man who had been walking his entire life. So the miracle was complete. It was total. And the thing of, of it was, everyone knew who this guy was. And they knew he wasn't faking. And here's the other thing that you have to understand. Notice what it says, and entered with them into the temple. Now here was a man who could not walk, therefore could not enter into the temple or into the presence of God. Here was a sinner. That's what sinners are. 
Sinners are lame. They cannot walk with God. They cannot enter into the presence of God. And he, the minute that miracle occurred, he immediately left and jumped and walked into the very presence of God, walked into the temple. And that's exactly what happens to sinners. Exactly. It is instantaneous. Here are sinners, because of their sin, are crippled and cannot walk with God, cannot go into the presence of God, immediately upon salvation, immediately upon accepting Christ, immediately upon believing in the name of Jesus, immediately they can stand, walk, leap, praise God, and walk into the very presence of God. In fact, they are given the Holy Spirit, God himself, and they are in the presence of God, instantly. And that's important to understand the, relation, the, the, the illustration that God has given. And if anyone is watching, anyone should be, able, should be able to pick this up. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. It's interesting, isn't it? Everybody saw this miracle. And everybody saw the result of this miracle. Have you ever... I don't know if you have, I, I, I hope you, you have, seen a person who has a very poor reputation and uh, they get saved. And, and all of a sudden they get, saved, they get saved and they are gloriously saved. They are gloriously saved. They truly are. And all of a sudden you can actually see it in their lifestyle. Their lives actually change. Uh, and then they change, their personality change, their voices change. I use the illustration of myself when I was 33, and, uh, and I got saved at 33, or I was, the Lord saved me at 33. And I was teaching in the public schools, and it had been about three or four months since I'd been saved, and some of my college buddies were traveling through town, and they decided to stop in at the local high school and pay me a visit, and I was in class, and they stopped in, and they, we talked for about 20 minutes. Now, when they exited the building, they had to go back in front of the school office to exit the building. And I had to bring a report to the school office. So I went in the, my room, grabbed the report, and walked. And I was about 20 feet behind them, and they were talking about me, and I could hear them. They didn't know I was there. And one of the things they said, which stunned me because I, I, did, I hadn't noticed it, man, he doesn't even talk the same. And I didn't know I was changing. And I was changing. I was changing, not quite as fast as this man here has changed, but I was changing. And people noticed it, just like they noticed this man walking and praising God and leaping. In other words, they knew his background, and here he was walking, doing something he could not do. How old was he? Tradition puts him somewhere around 40. So it's not a case of not knowing who this man was. People knew who this man was. Now there were a lot of visitors in Jerusalem at this time from all over the Mediterranean, and they probably didn't know who this man was, but if they had been there for a couple of months, which is or 50 days rather, they certainly would have seen him every day at, the, at the, this gate. So uh, I'm not so sure they, they didn't know, those people didn't know who he was. And it says they knew that it was he who sat and begged for alms at the, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Now go back to Pentecost. Go back to when they heard people speaking in tongues and they saw the tongues of fire. And they heard this mighty noise of like a mighty wind. And they said, well, these people are drunk. And they mocked, some mocked, some belittled. You don't see that here, do you? You don't see that. Why? Because they can visibly see the change. They can visibly see what the change is. If a person comes in into, into the room, and I've talked to people who were saved, I said, did you tell your parents last night that you, you got saved? Yes. And what was the reaction? There wasn't any. Why? Because the parents can't see it. See? Can't see it. But boy, if they had looked into heaven, they would have seen a celebration. They would have seen angels cheering. They would have been, they would have been seen a great excitement. But here, you don't see it. There's no change. 
But believe me, when a person's saved, there is a change going on, and people will eventually recognize it. Here they recognize it immediately. And as the layman was healed, held Peter and John, all the people ran together onto them in the porch, that is called Solomon's, one greatly wondering. Now, when the people saw this man holding on to John, they saw him leaping and jumping and praising God, but then all of a sudden they saw him holding on to God. These unsaved men assumed that this man, this lame man, this previously lame man, was holding on to John and, and Peter because they were the source of his healing. And they couldn't tell the difference. In other words, did John and Peter have the power to heal people? And so if, if that were true, my goodness, you've got to understand, there was no medicine in those days. There was no hospitals. There wasn't medicine that we had. There wasn't a place where they could go and buy a drug, etc. In other words, you got sick. You were pretty much in the care of, of the people who uh, could handle them the best they could and, and keep them comfortable and, and do for them. But that was it. There was no advanced medicine like we have today. So as, as you look at this, they, they came running to, just like this blind man, to Peter and John, assuming that the power came from them. And that is the cause of the sermon that Peter is going to give. And the, and the sermon is going to be on Jesus Christ. Peter and John are going to proclaim Jesus Christ as the Savior, as the Messiah. And they're going to present it in an argument. They're going to present it in such a way that when they lay out the facts, the bare facts, etc., of this entire case, the Jewish people, the Jewish men here, will not be able to deny it. They will be left in one position to either accept it or to reject it. That's the only place, that's the only two choices they have. So next week, we will uh, talk about this sermon and how powerful it was because uh, literally, it, instead of 3,000 being saved, 5,000 were now saved. You will see a great number of believers in, in Jerusalem and they will scatter throughout the, the Mediterranean and the gospel will begin to be spread. So next week, uh, we will discuss the sermon. We have just discussed the introduction or the reason for the sermon. And that was to validate the Apostle, and therefore what the Apostles are going to say, what Peter is going to say, has been validated by this miracle. And these men know it. So, until next week, I wish you Godspeed uh, from Victory's side. Good day. <laughs>